Kick off episode number 44 of Monster Kid Radio with the band Paraito Ketchup. The song says, That's Right. It's from their album, That's Right. You can find out more about them over at their website, ParaitoKetchup.com. That's pirate with an O at the end, and then ketchup like you put on your fries.com. They also have a Bandcamp page, ParaitoKetchup.Bandcamp.com. There will be links to all of this in the show notes over at MonsterKidRadio.net. I am your host, and producer Derek M. Cook, and I want to welcome you to this week's episodes of Monster Kid Radio. This is the podcast devoted to the classics and sometimes not so classic monster movies of yesteryear. And this week we've got a doozy. This week we've got one of my favorite non hammer Peter Cushing films. It's from 1966, it's directed by Terrence Fisher. It's Island of Terror. Now, this is a movie that was relatively new to me. I think the first time I saw it was maybe last year. It was introduced to me by Tom Bigler. You remember him? He was on the show before. Well, he's going to be on the show again this week to talk about Island of Terror. And stay tuned, because at the end of this episode, I'm going to give you a clue on how you can win the diorama, the sculpture that Tom has created, inspired by Island of Terror. If you head over to MonsterKidRadio.net or look at your iPod, might even turn up on Stitcher, the episode image this week is a picture of the sculpture. So go check that out. And then, like I said, stay tuned. At the end of the episode, I'm going to give you a clue on how you can enter to win this one-of-a-kind piece of art by Tom Beagler. Tom's a great guest. I was happy to have him on the show again. It's been too long, man. Let's get some of our other contact information out of the way here. You can always give us a call and leave us a voicemail at 503-479-5MKR or send us an email at monsterkidradio at gmail.com. I'd like to maybe start building up some more feedback and do another feedback episode down the line. So if you have any thoughts about anything that we've covered here on the show in the past or any Monster Kid friendly movies, let me know and we'll include that in an upcoming feedback episode episode. Remember, we're also on Facebook. We have a Facebook group and a Facebook page. You can like the page, you can join the group and take part in the conversations that are happening there between episodes. We also have the Live 365 channel, the YouTube channel, the Flickr album. You can get to all of that by going to our website. Again, that's monsterkidradio.net. And finally, I don't think I've mentioned it for about a week. (laughs) Uh, We're trying to get 50 reviews in the iTunes store. As of this recording, we have 20 reviews. If we can get up to 50 reviews in the iTunes store, I'm going to do something special here on Monster Kid Radio that I'm pretty sure you guys and gals are going to like, but we got to get the 50 reviews, and then we'll do it. So that is our challenge. If you can get to 35 reviews in the iTunes store... I'll tell everybody what that something special is, but we got to get the 50 for that to happen. So if you haven't rated us in the iTunes store yet, please drop us an honest review. If you know anybody who listens to the show through iTunes, ask them if they've given us a rating yet, because we're trying to get to that number and it's good for everybody. And finally, one other bit of business. If you head over to Karloff.com, you'll see that there's a petition started to have the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences to present a lifetime award to Boris Karloff. Now, there will be a link in the show notes to this, but if you want to go straight to the website right now, karloff.com slash question mark page underscore ID equal sign 1422 or just Google karloff.com petition. I'll probably mention this a couple of times on future episodes of Monster Kid Radio as well. I think any time that we can honor any of the originals, any of the people that made Monster Kid movies, who made monster movies, horror movies in general, important to people like us and well pretty much all of movie dumb i mean without universal monsters well anyway you guys know how important boris karloff is if we can convince the academy to give karloff a lifetime achievement award how amazing would that be so again link in the show notes or just go look it up yourself and sign your name to this virtual petition okay we're going to get to part one of our conversation about island of terror with tom Beagler. Right after this. Hammer Film Productions began in 1934, and after producing almost 200 films and television programs, the studio is still releasing and re releasing new and classic film titles. 1951 Down Place is the podcast that brings you the story of the great Hammer films, one movie at a time. Here are your hosts describing what Hammer means to them. First is Casey. Hammer means the beautiful and glamorous women of Hammer Horror, the engaging storytelling 
and amazing period films. Joining him is Derek. Hammer means the incredible work of actors like Peter Cushing, Christopher Lee, and even Michael Ripper. The gothic storytelling, the incredible music, and the set pieces. And finally, here's Scott. Hammer, that's vodka and orange juice. (laughs) This boy has a lot to learn. Join our hosts as they make their journey through the Hammer Films catalogue and discuss each film with critical opinion, historical facts, production notes, and other information about these classic films. 1951 Down Place can be found in iTunes or their website, www.1951downplace.com. Wait, that's a screwdriver. 1951 Down Place, the home of Hammer Films discussion. This is Jackie Ray Naaman Jones. I play Debbie in Monos, the Hands of Fate, and you're listening to Monster Kid Radio. You know who I've got back here on Monster Kid Radio? I got Monster Kid, sculptor fan, <laughs> contributor to the show, Tom Bigler. How you doing, Tom? I'm doing great, Derek. It's great <laughs> to be here. Happy to be here. How's it been since the last time we had you on the show? It's been awesome. What can I say? <laughs> no, it's just been, you know, this and that. Yeah. I think you know I've been having a lot of back issues. I'm mm. uh, not a young man anymore, so but I've been spending a lot of time in my uh I'm lucky enough to have a hot tub. Uh-huh. And uh it's undercover, so I I have a TV hooked up out there. So when I go out and soak, I can pipe in some uh, monster kid friendly there you uh, go. movies. There you go. Gives me a chance to catch up on some incredibly cheesy and uh, some not so cheesy and real good movies. The classic and not so classic, as that's, we like to say here. Yes, that's correct. Right on. And you've been doing a lot more. Are you been sending me some pictures from some of your sculptures? Yeah, I'm just kind of experimenting. This is the first stuff I've done since. Uh, you and I became friends. I used to draw some. Right. But I just kind of decided to try something new. And uh-huh. that's, I, I really enjoy it. I would encourage anybody. You know, it's such an easy thing to do. And all you need is a, a piece of clay. You don't need any tools. You don't need mm-hmm. anything. And you'd be surprised what you could create if you just gave it a shot, I bet. I keep meaning to. I, I mean, I've been doing the drawing. Mm-hmm. You know, every once in a while, I'm like, you know, I, I should just get down with Tom and, and get some Sculpey on my own. Get like the butter knife out so I have something to push it around with Uh, or something, you know. It it looks fun. It's a hobby that I find really relaxing. You know, Mm -hmm. I can just sit there and kind of lose myself. I'll, you know, maybe be watching the movie I'm sculpting. You know, I mainly do monster stuff because that's pretty easy. Right. uh, As far as, you know, likeness and stuff. But That's what we love. Yeah, of course. And as I, you know, I'm hoping I can get better and maybe, you know, I'd like to do a Peter Cushing (gasps) bus someday, but... I don't know. It's pretty intimidating so he's, far. He's got those cheekbones, man. I know. <laughs> Famous <laughs> cheekbones. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, speaking of Peter Cushing. Oh, yeah. The movie that we're going to talk about mm-hmm. is one of my favorite non-Hammer Peter Cushing films, Island of Terror. Dun, dun. This is actually something that I wasn't overly familiar with until, well, you brought it to my attention. Yeah. I you told it. me about it for the yeah. first time, and I went and I tracked it down, and I think... Uh, I think there's a DVD release available of it over in the UK. I think is how you have to get it now. It's not available here commercially in the States, but it's worth the search because it's so good. It's a Peter Cushing movie that, you know, because it's he's so famous for uh, Dr. Frankenstein and right. Van Helsing and, you know, so much of his other stuff that this is something that came out in, I think it was 66. 66, that's correct. Um, and it's a really entertaining little movie that uh, I don't think a lot of people know about. Right. Yeah, no, it came out in 66 from Planet Film Productions. It's the name of the production company. This is one of those studios that kind of popped up around because of the success of Hammer and you know, Amicus and all these other little guys uh, trying to, well, Hammer's not a little guy, but these other little studios trying to get in on the British mm-hmm. horror thing. So they put together the the means, the crew, to make this movie with director Terrence Fisher. Mm-hmm. Terrence Fisher, I, I guess he's a Hammer legend. I mean, you know, without oh, no. Terrence Fisher, we wouldn't have, you know, the Dracula, the Curse of Frankenstein, any of that. So we've got Terrence Fisher doing the direction on this. we got Peter Cushing. Interestingly enough, not necessarily in the main lead role. No, that would be uh, Edward Judd. Edward Judd, who I really liked in this. What, what did <laughs> yeah. you think? Uh-oh, you got <laughs> this look on your face. <laughs> no, I, I liked him. Uh-huh. He was just kind of, I don't know, maybe he was just a little too hammy for me. He is a little, little, yeah, bit, a but, little you know, bit. But it was, it was charming, you uh-huh. know, but it was just kind of, I don't know. 
<laughs> no, he was fine. I liked the camaraderie <laughs> between him and Peter Cushing. That was fun. The, the characters had this kind of chemistry, this charisma mm-hmm. that I really enjoyed. Peter Cushing shows up and says, jump. And he's like, okay, let's do it. Let's jump. <laughs> you know, they had a relationship and a friendship and a, and a teamwork that I really liked. In fact, that goes throughout the entire film, which we'll get to, I'm sure. Mm-hmm. Uh, but those are our two main players. And, of course, Carol Gray, who is our female lead. Because mm-hmm. you got to have that. Mm-hmm. And she was pretty good. She was fine she was for what she had cute, to do real cute yeah um well yeah that's we'll talk about that too that's a situation with the female character that i think could have been she yeah was, she was pretty well we'll get there she was she she was pretty weak in this as far as she served her purpose she did but she was really reliant on uh yeah on edward on edward judd yes who was who? Oh, David West. That's right. He was Dr. David West. Cushing was Dr. Brian Stanley, and Carol was Tony Merrill. Correct. Yes. The movie is mid-60s British science fiction, and it pretty much all takes place on a place called Petrie's Island. Mm-hmm. I don't know if they're making kind of like a little uh, jokey kind of – it's called Petrie's Island because you can get Petri dishes. I don't, I don't know. Oh. But Petrie's mm-hmm. Island is this isolated – is it Irish island? I am not sure, to be honest. I, I, think I kind of assumed it was, but yeah. I, I, I don't know if I ever really thought about it. And they make it clear within the first, I'd say, five minutes of the movie. It's isolated. You can't get to it. There's one emergency vehicle to get from the island to the mainland. <laughs> the fog's coming in, so you know the weather's going to be tough, so you're not going to be able to get a plane in. They make it pretty clear that this island is completely isolated, perfect setting for a science fiction horror movie, especially when you realize that somebody's doing something with radiation <laughs> on the island because he wants to get away from it all and not yeah. be distracted in his research. The perfect storm. Yes. yes. For action. And the research is he's trying to cure cancer. Yes, a noble cause. Can't blame him for that. No. So you've got this perfect mix, this perfect setup, where you've got this, <laughs> I guess they're playing with radiation on an island out in the middle of nowhere. We're off and running. We got our movie going. Mm-hmm. What happens, and I don't know if we want to overly spoil the movie. It is worth the search if you're going to try to track mm-hmm. this movie down. So I don't want to spoil everything about it, but we should talk a little bit about the story itself. Oh, yeah. We can get up to... Halfway through. Yeah, we get to a certain halfway point. So we've got the startup. We see the lab. Things are pretty high tech, I guess, for the 60s. Mm-hmm. We've got this isolated location. We've got characters worrying about the fog coming in. It's, man, I, I tell you, the setup is just perfect. Now, none of our lead characters are from the island, however. Or the three leads that we talked about, they're from the mainland and they end up coming in. They need to be brought in because Dr. Reginald Landers, played by Eddie Byrne, I think I pronounced that right. Who also appeared in Hammer's The Mummy. He's the local. Yes. Between him and Constable Harris, played by Sam Kidd, who's just wonderful in his role, they find a body. Now, am I getting too far ahead, or do you think we can just dive right into this body? Because I think no, the body think discovery should, is pretty dark. Well, yeah, cool. that's basically it. They set it up with the lab. Um, they're going to do something. And there's other labs around the world that they're supposed to be coordinated with. (laughs) And one of the the scientists, um, he makes a comment that he put the results in the mail and they should get it tomorrow. So it's okay to start. Yeah, they mentioned a couple of different cities. It's not just Petri's Island and they mentioned Tokyo and they mentioned a couple of other locations as well. No, you're, you're right. I totally forgot that, which, you know, gets referenced later. You know, and that's probably all we should really say about that. But it does get reference later. So yeah, it's basically that setup, and then you have the splash screen of Island of Terror. I love the and opening shows credits. The, the lab with everybody. Yeah, I loved Sushi. it. I loved it because I love the music in this thing, man. It had I, some awesome. Music. I love the music. It's by Malcolm Lockyer, who did the Peter Cushing, one of the Peter Cushing Doctor Who films. Oh. I don't know much more about what he's done. I wish there was some way to get this on my iPod because I love the music in this thing. I'm a film score guy. You know, I oh, kind of pay attention to that stuff. I so know you are. <laughs> but yeah, you get the opening credits and then we're back to life at Petri's Island. It's pretty, I don't know. I don't know. What do they do at Petri's Island? I guess it's a farming community. <laughs> That's all I could figure out. I thought yeah. about that today when I was watching part of it. I thought, I'm not really sure what these What's the economy? 30 people do here on this remote island. Right. Um, yeah. But there are sheep and there are cattle and there are... There's a pub. There's a pub. <laughs> and, and the one law enforcement officer, the constable, gets around on a bicycle. Yeah. No phones. Oh, no, that's they, right. They're maybe going to put him in next year. 
they said through when they were talking. And there's constant power problems. <laughs> the generator keeps going out, and they well, we we keep getting on them to fix it. <laughs> It's a strange. It's a strange place. I really enjoy the. That's one thing that's always just my, on a personal note. I've always really enjoyed uh, isolated settings yes. for these kinds of things. You know that really cuts you off from anything. But this one was just. I don't know. I mean, if, if I lived on an island, I would have a boat. It's like they only have <laughs> one boat on this whole island, and they're going to get rid of the boat people, here soon. So you're yeah, totally the, screwed. <laughs> Then they just, well, anyway, go ahead, yeah. Eric, I'm sorry. No, no, you're right. I mean, it's, this is overly isolated for the sake of the story, which, I mean, you need to have that for what's going to happen in the film. And I appreciate that they went through such, or went to such great lengths to make sure we all understood that there is no help coming from the mainland. We mm-hmm. can't get there. They can't get to us. So I appreciate the way that they did it at yeah. the very beginning, set it all up. So it's not a, oh, here's my cell phone and call someone. You know, you can't do that in a modern movie now. Yeah. So I appreciated yeah. that. And that's one thing. When they first start, you know, first off, if we just talk about the beginning of it, I guess, somebody discovers a body. Yes. It's all smooshy. And they don't show it to us right away. It's more just the guy's reaction to it, and you don't get a lot of detail. No, I think you just they maybe show the coat or something. Yeah. But. Well, the constable goes to the local doctor and gets him involved. Okay. And then it's the local doctor... Uh, Landers, who knows somebody on the mainland, uh, Dr. Stanley, who then gets Dr. West involved. So uh, so he tells a friend, and he tells a friend, and they all come back out to the island. Peter Cushing's playing a scientist, mm-hmm. and, and Cushing does the scientist role just fine. I mean, I oh, yeah. I, I would take a class from him. <laughs> and, and believe You'd do every anything word. with Peter Cushing. It, it, pretty much, pretty darn close. Yeah, yeah. But he doesn't know a lot about bones, so he's got to get the bone specialist in. Mm-hmm. And that's when we're going to meet Dr. Stanley. And, uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, not Dr. Stanley, Dr. West. And, oh, yeah, Dr. like West, you said. Yeah, yeah the mm-hmm. him and his little minx, which is kind of, you know, that's the setup when <laughs> it's like, oh, oh. It gets worse. It gets worse. There's a line exchange in this movie <laughs> oh, that I, I, I remember love. it. I was going to do some of it. I was going to add to it. I thought they should just do the whole movie with this. You mean the double in Tondra yeah, with the yeah. racing? Uh-huh. Oh, have you got enough petrol? And- oh, no, no. I wasn't. Gonna, there's that, of course. No. no. When they, I'm skipping ahead, but when they all get to the island and they're talking about how, what are they going, oh, what are we going game. to do to keep ourselves busy? Yeah. Well, I guess we can play solitaire. Well, I've got a better idea in mind. <laughs> the, the other two lovebirds exchange and Cushing's like, can I play? It's like, dude, do you. Do- <laughs> <laughs> well, you know. It was the 60s, maybe. It was the 60s. <laughs> Three-way so, with Peter Cushing. That I'm, not, well, I'm not saying that's what I wanted. I'm uh, just... Oh, it's okay, Derek. <laughs> so what I am is excited about how <laughs> she was interested yeah, or yeah. Inter- introduced in the movie. Yes. Yeah. Um, she comes in wearing a shirt. She can't <laughs> find the dressing gown. Apparently, he spilled something on her. Uh, he spilled her- wine. Yes. Because he's a lot better at cutting people than opening bottles of wine i wouldn't be surprised if he did it on purpose because you know (laughs) but this is when cushing shows up he kind of crashes the party Mm -hmm. and dr Uh, west who is very interested in all things bone (laughs) puts the brakes on the party and and they're going to go investigate and figure out what's going on and how are they going to get back well this is where tony's useful because her father has a helicopter. Yeah, he's very wealthy. Yes. They could take the jump back to the island, the little boat that they took, but now it's faster to take the helicopter. So even though at the beginning when Dr. Landers is talking about how he's going to take the jump back or, or the boat out to the mainland, the constable or whoever is telling him, make sure you bring it back. It's our only way off the island <laughs> if we need it. Okay, no problem. <laughs> nope. They're going to get in a helicopter and take off. And when they get to the helicopter and they get to the island in the helicopter – I'm sorry, your father needs a helicopter back. I can't wait around. Oh, okay, no problem. So now we are totally isolated. <laughs> You're done. That's bring, true. To bring, bring on the monsters. <laughs> well, at least at the time, they didn't really know. That's true. You know, because they hadn't really seen a silicate yet. <gasps> so they were... Silicate. Insert silicate noise now. <laughs> it's so tropey. This, this, yeah. this movie is just like a lot of movies pretty full of tropes well and we a lot of them you know we're watching this movie now to knowing 
monsters are going to show up. They're playing with radiation. It's the 60s. It's a science fiction movie. This is not good. But the characters don't know. And they, they, they play along until they see a silicate. Mm-hmm. Or a mushy, squishy body <laughs> or two. Do we want to say what the silicates do? They suck your bones out. Basically, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Through little the, holes in your skin. The first time we see a silicate, I think, is maybe in the lab. Yeah. Peter Cushing <laughs> and Edward Judd. Yeah. They go to the lab and... I think that might be the first time that we saw them fully. Now, before that, I thought we saw one of the tentacles of one. That could be. Like like a tentacle drop down. And they do have this like tentacle protuberance kind of thing at the front of them that wraps around you. And I'm assuming that's where they inject whatever it is they inject in you to make your bones dissolve. And we do see like the, the tentacle thing drop down and grab one of the characters. Ah, uh, okay. Uh, before that. But then when they are trying to get into the lab where they're doing all the cancer research, they have to break in because nobody's answering the door. They find more squishy bodies and they find the silicate in the hallway. I mean, what did you think the first time you saw it? The first time I saw it, it was probably 30 years ago or 40 years ago. I thought it was kind of cool. You know, that's a new take yeah. on, on, on monsters. You know, it's well, not new, but um, it's not your typical uh, bipedal right you know creature so i right. think that was that was cool but the bad thing is that's also the downfall of this creature is that it's cool looking and the, the concept is cool but and maybe we'll get into it but um <laughs> there's no way it can climb trees <laughs> climb on <laughs> roofs <laughs> and that's part of it and that's basically yeah. one of their major attacks anyway maybe we'll get to that part but there's one scene where mm-hmm when they're trying to take care of the silicates and then they're damaged that somebody's throwing a uh, Molotov cocktail mm-hmm. and he looks up and there's a silicate in the tree 30 feet up. Right. And I just don't know how a squishy monster like that could have climbed the tree. Yeah. I mean, there, there's one in the tree. It climb, One climbs over a car because we see it slide down a windshield. And the first time we see the tentacle or whatever, it's attacking from the ceiling. So somehow it got up high and then dropped the, the cord down to grab the guy. Like... I don't know how it did that because it seems very heavy. <laughs> very heavy, very slow. Yeah. I mean, it, when, when Peter Cushing's out there doing his thing, throwing some Molotovs at him and stuff, mm-hmm. I mean, they're just kind of moving like <laughs> an inch every uh, yeah. uh, a few seconds, really. Very yeah. slow. But that's, you know, that again is one of the tropes, just like that this movie is the same as a lot of movies. Right. That these incredibly slow moving, noisy or whatever creatures can always seem to surprise so many people so often. Mm-hmm. You know, in this movie, he's, they surprise Peter Cushing and they're just too slow to do that, I think. Yeah, I can see that. And it, it is, like you said, one of the tropes you, you got to have, at least at this time period. I mean, you've got these kind of slow, non-human looking things like the blob wasn't very fast Mm -hmm. you know so you've got these kind of amoeba like things these giant silicate like things you know and i mean i still love them (laughs) no i I think they're awesome you know and we're just you you have to understand 66 they couldn't do it right back then i mean it it was a cool concept and now yeah they could use uh, all kind of special effects and cgi and probably make yeah, it if they look wanted to. Yeah. like you wanted to go up a tree and they could probably remake it with mm-hmm. you know and make them a lot more quote unquote realistic right you know but when i saw it back then that you know it didn't matter yeah and that's and the it thing still doesn't. i think yeah and i think you go into these movies kind of knowing you know they've aged a little bit and some things about the movie is kind of it's not just the monsters. There's some things that have kind of aged a little bit, like the role of the women or the one woman. You know, in the you know, that just it's one of those things that you accept when you watch an older movie like this. Mm-hmm. I like the design of the silicate. I think it's pretty cool. The tentacle probably flops around a little bit too much for my tastes. It looks like somebody's just to tied the end of it to a piece of fishing line. It's just kind of moving it back and mm-hmm. forth. You know, a la like Reptilicus's Rit- head or something. You know, it's a, which I, I don't find that scary, but then. If it came up to me and sucked my bones out, maybe I'd be a little bit more afraid of it. Well, probably. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it's, it just kind of looks like a vacuum cleaner hose or something yeah, again. That yeah. They tie to the end of and just kind of, yeah. Mm-hmm. It takes somebody out in the lab. And in the lab, you do see more corpses, more deflated bodies, which I wasn't really expecting that level of, it wasn't gory, mm-hmm. but that level of destruction of the human body in a movie from the 60s. Maybe mm-hmm. I should have. 
Because it wasn't overly bloody and gory, but it made for some neat imagery. Mm -hmm. I bought it. I bought that the bones were gone. You know, through the movie, before we actually see the bodies, some of the characters are saying they look like jelly. Mm -hmm. You know, and they look like they just don't have any mat, you know, any uh, structure. It's just kind of this fleshy mess. They look a little bit more rubbery than than that when you actually see them, but they still look pretty cool. Mm -hmm. And they don't just take out people. We see that they took out a horse. Mm -hmm. And... I mean, cows. They ate a lot of cows. Yeah, they ate a lot of cows. That's not a spoiler. Well, no. maybe if you're a no. cow fan, <laughs> if you love cows, don't watch this movie because a lot of cows get eaten. Hey, I'm a vegetarian and I still enjoyed it. I'm okay with that. Okay. That's, you know, no cows were harmed in the making of <laughs> Island of Terror. One, one can hope. In the lab, we see that the silicates are pretty resistant to most forms of attack. Mm. They try to go after. They try to cut it. Mm-hmm. With an axe. And that doesn't work. No. No. And throughout the movie, they're going to do other things. You mentioned the Molotov cocktail. Bullets. Um, bullets. There's a lot of bullets. Even TNT. They tried uh, TNT. They tried to blow these things up and still didn't work. Well, they were pretty bad aims. Well, that's true. Well, they're farmers. <laughs> I mean, it's not like farmers with oh. TNT. <laughs> I did make a note, though, on here. Okay. What do you got? Um, if you watch them throw Molotov cocktails, I notice Edward Judd. Uh-huh. He throws like a girl. Really? Yeah. Just watch. He does a little chicken wing thing <laughs> where he throws a Molotov cocktail, but he looks like he's... And anyway. But some girls can throw good. I don't... Uh, no, I, know. I I'm not a sexist. That was just a... <laughs> that was like a, you know, I'm just kidding around. No, no. But yeah, he looks like he just kind of flips it, flicks it out there. Huh. So. I didn't notice. I'll have to go back own. and... Yeah. Yeah, you should watch the whole movie again so you can see that. I do like the scene. I know we're kind of skipping around a little bit now, but... We are. That's okay. Once the silicates are known as a threat, I do like that finally whoever's in charge of the island shows up mm -hmm. and meets with uh, Peter Cushing and Edward Judd mm -hmm. in the bar. And this is the point in the movie where if it was an American sci-fi movie, the scientist said, okay, you've got radioactive monsters. They're sucking bones out of people. The authorities would say, uh-huh. Yeah, right. And not believe you. <laughs> but in this movie, for whatever reason, like, oh, tell me more. Oh, really? Okay, let's do it. Let's take, you know, let's team up. I love that science is trusted in this film. You don't, at least I don't feel like you see that in a lot of like maybe 50 sci-fi movies. At least you've got the, the resistance to the scientists coming in and trying to save the day. Whereas this one, it's like, oh, all right, science will save us. Let's all work together. I did like that. I thought it was kind of a neat That is. I didn't even difference. notice that, but when you say that, that does ring true. Now, granted, if Peter Cushing showed up and said, this is what's going on. I believe him. Well, we've got over it's, we've, we've, we've gone over this. <laughs> You'd be down on your hands and knees. <laughs> <laughs> yes, let's go fight silicates together. <laughs> so I, I did like that, and I do like that they all try to work together to a common goal. You don't have, you know, one group of characters going off and doing this, and another character doing that over here because he's got a better idea. I like that everybody kind of comes together and unites, and I do like that about the film as well. There's not that kind of we're all under pressure, so we're all going to kind of go do our own thing and not work as a team. Mm -hmm. So I did like that about this as well. Granted, it does mean that everybody gets holed up in one location and rounded up for the silicates to come calling, but it's a nice idea. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I double-checked. Tom and I were talking about it. Island of Terror is not available as a Region 1 release. I checked on Netflix, I checked on Amazon, couldn't find it. However, it looks like at one point it was released as a Region 2 DVD. I'm looking at a link right now at Amazon.co.uk where you can buy used copies. Now, that doesn't do you any good if you're anywhere other than the UK because these independent sellers are typically not going to ship overseas. It does look like there is an import for the UK version of Island of Terror from 12... 90 pounds i'm sorry i'm not sure what the conversion rate is on that but it is out there you can get your hands on it highly recommend it if you can't tell tom and i both love this movie and we're going to be back in part two to talk about this movie a little bit more as well as a few other things including some of his artwork and that's what we want to talk about now he has this amazing diorama of Two silicates, one splitting. It looks wonderful. Again, look at the episode image because that's what I'm using as the album for this particular episode of Monster Kid Radio. I'll also do it for the next episode as well. It looks great. So if you are interested in getting your name in the drawing for this sculpt, you got to come back next time for the exact instructions. But I'm going to give you a clue. 
start thinking about modern monster movies. Okay? That's what I want to say. Modern monster movies. Think about some of your favorites and how they might relate to what we talk about here on MKR. Big thanks to Tom for appearing on this episode of Monster Kid Radio. And again, we'll have him back in part two. Also, big thanks to Paraito Ketchup. And I apologize if I'm mispronouncing their name. You can find them at paraitoketchup.bandcamp.com or paraitoketchup.com. The song we're going to be going out on is That's Right. That's what you heard at the very beginning. It's from the album That's Right. Monster Kid Radio is a registered service mark of Monster Kid Radio, LLC. All original content of Monster Kid Radio by Monster Kid Radio, LLC is licensed under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivations, 3.0, unported license. Of course, as I said, that's right up here. It's by permission of the band. See you next time. (laughs) 